You're listening to Leading Up with Udemy. This podcast is your guide to developing your skills as an emerging or seasoned leader. I'm Alan Todd, your host and the Vice President of Leadership Development at Udemy. Together, we can work, lead, and live differently to create a better world. This week, I'm speaking with Roberta Matchison about what makes a magnetic leader and how to learn valuable leadership lessons even before you're given your first direct report. The big aha I get from Roberta is just this idea that you have to manage up. It doesn't matter if you're an individual contributor or a senior leader, managing up is as important as managing down. And it's not about brown nosing or being liked. It's about actually developing relationships and investing in maintaining those relationships. They think, oh, I have to be best friends with my employees. And that's not the intent at all. The intent is to decode your boss, figure out what their style is so that you can deliver the work to them in the manner that they'd like to receive it. Roberta is an executive coach who has written a whopping seven books on talent management, including Suddenly in Charge, Can We Talk, and The Magnetic Leader. For over 25 years, Roberta has taught leaders of many organizations, from General Motors to Best Buy, Boston Beer, New Balance, and others. From Fortune 500 companies to small businesses, Roberta helps them to maximize their talent and grow. She's also got a brand new Udemy course called Pay Transparency and Advocacy, which I'm excited to ask her about too. Roberta, welcome to the podcast. Thank you, Alan. I'm very excited to be here. So it feels appropriate to start a conversation about leadership and leading up and managing up by defining our North Star. So I want to do that by referencing your book, The Magnetic Leader. And you tell us that people don't work for companies, they work for people and that the best people want to work for magnetic leaders. So tell us, Roberta, what makes one a magnetic leader? Well, magnetic leaders are leaders who attract talent wherever they go. And not only do they attract talent wherever they go, that talent is so connected to them, as opposed to what we would consider leaders who have talent run away from them. Yeah, in your book, you quoted a survey where I, I thought this is funny. The second biggest wish about someone's manager is that they quit. So why do people so dislike their boss? Well, you know, in all fairness, I think a lot of bosses, you know, they've never gotten any training, right? And so like I write about in Suddenly in Charge and which happened to me is, you know, you wake up one day and you're anointed. You are the boss. You are king. And nobody tells you how to do that job. And so you just do whatever you have to do and you yell orders and you just try to get stuff done. And as we know, that's not really the way to motivate people. But if you've never been taught best practices or you yourself have never had a great boss, it's kind of hard to learn these things on your own. Yeah, I've heard a couple times once I was talking to the person in charge of leadership development at GE Crotonville. This is maybe... 15 years ago. And he said to me, what we do is we find great talent and we, we throw them in the deep end without any thing. And the good ones learn to swim. And I have another friend, Mike Barger. He's one of the co-founders of JetBlue. And he said the exact same thing. He said, we were growing so fast. We promoted everybody before they were ready. And that got me thinking about your story is really much the same. So what's your advice to those that are selected or you're promoted before you're ready and you're there and you got to learn to swim and you haven't had the professional development, what do you do? Well, I always tell my coaching clients that if you don't manage up, you're not going to have to worry about managing down. And so what happens so often, and I was guilty of this as well, is that you get into these leadership roles and you're so busy trying to figure out the tactical pieces, right? You're so focused on getting things done, that you don't even think about managing the relationships, the relationships of the people above you, your peers, because now you have a new set of peers. And so if you don't do that, it's not going to be long before you get taken out by a wave that you never saw coming. Yeah. In your book, Suddenly in Charge, you quoted Peter Drucker, the management legend, who said back in 1954, you don't have to like your boss 
but you do have to manage them so that they help you get the resources you need to achieve personal success. So can you connect that Drucker quote to your thoughts on managing up? Well, I mean, look, a lot of people kind of think, oh, well, we have to be best friends, right? Just like they think, oh, I have to be best friends with my employees. And that's not the intent at all. The intent is to decode your boss, figure out what their style is so that you can deliver the work to them in the manner that they'd like to receive it. And so it's so important to do this. And it's never really taught in school. You don't get taught how to manage up in college. And it's so critical. So when I wrote Suddenly in Charge, it actually, the book became an international bestseller because this topic is so compelling. And the third edition of this book will be coming out in the spring of 2024. So it's a topic that's evergreen, but clearly a topic that we need to get much better at. You said something also that I liked it, something along the lines of you are totally responsible for the development and maintenance of your relationship with your boss. No one has a bigger interest in this than you. And I think plenty of people don't think that. They think it's their boss's job to manage them. And they hadn't been. So the concept is foreign. And I think from years of experience, I think it's critically important. So I really like what you said. How do you convince people it's their job to own the relationship with the boss? Well, I don't think I have to convince them. I think what happens is they get fired, right? Which happened to me. And you get fired and then you're like, wow, well, what what went wrong here? And when you look back and you educate yourself about managing up, then you sort of say, oh, maybe I didn't do that. Maybe I should be doing that the next time around. One of the key factors that you mentioned is the fact that it's not just managing your boss, but you have to maintain that relationship, right? It's not like you throw your boss a party and then that's like the end. It's like cultivating and creating this relationship over time, which takes effort. Well, and you said something like, look, it's not about being a brown noser and it's not about being the boss's favorite. And I think But I guess my question is, you said, you know, you have to get fired to learn it. What advice do you have right now for somebody to not get fired to learn this valuable lesson? Well, I think you have to acknowledge first and foremost that it is your responsibility. Your boss is not going to manage you. Your boss has like 20 people. One of my clients has 700 people under them. The likelihood of her managing each person individually is slim to none. However, you do want to be able to stand out in the crowd of employees. And so it's so important to do what I call shameless promotion, where you promote yourself and let your boss know what you've accomplished, but you do it in a way that's not too showy. So many people have a hard time sharing what they've done, all the good things they've done. And so their boss has no idea, especially at review time, right? And so they're shocked when they get their review because all the great things they did didn't get mentioned. But it's so important to go back and before your review, like weeks before your review, give your boss a list of everything that you have accomplished during the past year. Don't wait for them to put that together. Yeah, I think that's great advice. I suppose you have to have the courage to step up and advocate for yourself. Why wouldn't you? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I mean, you know, a lot of times it's so interesting because I coach people at different levels and I do coach a lot of senior level executives and even they have a hard time. And I'm like, you have to show up every day saying, these people are so lucky to have me. You can't be going into work thinking, I don't know why they ever hired me. I'm not that great, right? That's a whole different mindset. And that's a lot of the work that I do with my clients, right, is helping them see how great they really are. They wouldn't be in the jobs that they're in at the level that they're at if they weren't good. And so it's just kind of reminding them there's a reason why you're in this role. And you need to remind your boss why you were selected for this job. And you need to show up with a confident mindset every day. Yeah, I want to go back to the topic of culture. And you said one bad manager can have a dramatic negative impact on the entire culture. And so how do we keep the bad ones from getting in? And if they get in, how do we help them 
move on? Well, if you think about it, you'll go onto a website like Glassdoor and you'll read about a company and there'll be like all these employees saying how great it is to work there. And then there'll be some people who are like, oh my God, this place is awful, right? And if you look even, if you take a deeper dive, you'll usually see that these people are working in different departments. So it might be sunny in sales. There might be a great leader in sales, and it might be raining tears in customer service. So companies need to really spend a little more time when they're in the recruitment stage of making sure that they have the right people in the leadership roles. When they're interviewing people, making sure they have the right traits. So it's really important to kind of get under the hood and make sure you're getting the right person, checking references, using your informal network, finding out who you know on LinkedIn that might know somebody who might have worked for this person. So really spending a little bit more time so at the back end, you're not investing all this time trying to get this person out of your company where we're at these days with with the labor shortage. People are just so happy to find somebody that they want to hire. They're like willing to skip all that. It's sort of like when you get to a certain age, maybe the things that you thought were valuable in a partner, in a lifelong partner, like you're willing to give up half of them. <laughs> and then like you get married and a year later, you're looking to get divorced. <laughs> <laughs> you you got to stick to your principles. <laughs> yeah, let me ask you. So, Another guest we've had on the show, uh, Dave Patrick, uh, was the CEO at Charles Schwab um, and had a, a great career there. And he teaches at Wharton. And he's one thing he said is, you know, any time I ever uh, let someone go, I knew it might got a long time sooner. And I was always slow to do that. And he said, you know, kind of with age comes wisdom. Maybe that's something that I would tell my younger self I would do a little sooner. What are your thoughts on back to the, if the bad apple gets in, how do we help them move on? How quickly do you do, you do it the first second? Do you wait a year? What's the thought? Well, you definitely don't wait a year. And I'm glad you brought that up because I was working with the CEO of a hospital and, you know, he said to me, the biggest mistake in my career that I have ever made was waiting too long waiting too long to move people out of positions, especially when you first get into a job and you kind of have a good sense of, you know, who's the keepers here, who aren't. And then you just sort of let it slide and then it just gets harder and harder and harder. So my advice is as soon as you recognize that this person isn't coming on the next journey with us, then you need to take steps to help them transition out. Yeah, so it's if you have a company filled with magnetic leaders? How do you build basically a, a great place to work? You've said something like it's a beauty contest. And how do you build a great place to work that's not worried about the beauty contest? Let me explain that reference for people who don't quite know what that might mean. Uh, a lot of these best places to work awards are based on beauty contests. It's like, you know, you pay a PR agency to help you have your employees participate in these surveys, and then you do internal communication to make it look like you're really doing great work. And then you get hopefully voted, right? You get the award. Although there are people inside these organizations wondering, how the heck did that ever happen? <laughs> yeah, it looks like an arms race of benefits and lunches or vacations or massages or dog walkers or whatever. And it's funny because I was having dinner with a friend of mine who was a senior leader in a financial institution. And she said to me, oh, you know, we're coming up on our employee survey. We have to get 100% participation. So I said, well, how do you do that? And she said, well, I tell the team if they fill out the surveys that they, I will take them out to lunch at a restaurant of their choice. So then I said, well, what do they do with this survey information? She said, well, they don't do much. So the only thing that really changes is the location each year where we go to lunch. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I mean, I look at that and I'm like, okay, how many billions of dollars are companies spending on these employee surveys? They already know what to do. They're just not stepping up and doing it. Well, you're reminding me, and, and I've heard you said this before, but like investing in employee engagement for decades and decades and decades and doing the surveys and nothing has really changed in terms of moving the needle. So I'm curious to get your thoughts, like forget the surveys and the beauty contests, what moves the needle in your mind? How do we build a company full of magnetic leaders that creates a great place to work? 
Well, I, you do start by hiring the right people, right? And and getting really clear on what those people look like, what the traits are that they have. And then you make sure that you invest resources in those people and you give them the resources to hire other good people. And then you make sure you develop these people. You know, today's employee, Gen Z, I mean, millennials, really, they they all want career development. They all want to move up in their careers, and they want to have conversations about what their career specifically looks like. And when you don't have time or you don't have the desire to do that with them, they'll find another company and another leader who, who will do that for them. Yeah, and so developing people is critical, I think, to driving performance and retention uh, but you mentioned something about attracting the right people. And I'm curious, and you said they have to have the right traits. Like, is there a set of traits you think that are valuable that you would recruit for before you start the development? Well, I think it depends on the organization. I look at you know, like what would fit into a consulting firm like that or a law firm. What kind of leader is very different than the kind of leader that would build the right culture for a tech company very, very different. So you you have to figure out what are we trying to build here and then go from there. In Suddenly in Charge, you're working on third edition, what's changed since you originally wrote the book and and maybe what hasn't? Well, you know, I just finished the manuscript and I reread the book, right? (laughs) And I was like, wow, this is like really good. Like not a lot has really changed. And then I was like, oh my gosh, like not a lot has really changed. That's a problem. However, what has changed is when I wrote the last edition, which came out in 2017, there certainly wasn't a lot of remote work going on. And today, I don't think it's going away. And I wanted to be able to provide my readers with advice on how to manage up remotely, how to manage a team that is across the globe, because it does require some nuances to be effective as a leader. You can't just take that approach and apply it to your people who you may never see. So that was really the biggest change for me. Yeah, so give us, you have a tip or two on leading a hybrid team? You know, so many times we assume that, you know, when we want to have a difficult conversation with somebody, we just hop onto Zoom, right? We're like, you know what, we're going to have a call. I want to talk to you about this. I have an issue with this. But we never stop to pause to even ask that other person, hey, is this a good time? Can we speak somewhere where you have some privacy? I mean, maybe your seven-year-old is at the end of the table, you know, doing their homework. (laughs) They don't need to hear you being reamed out by your boss, you know. So it's really just taking a few moments to think about, hey, if I were on the receiving end, how would I want to be treated? Yeah, I love it. That's a great, that's a great tip. And I think there are stories that I've heard or read where that exact tip had been violated, right? And I think about Maya Angelou's quote, people may not remember what you said, but they (laughs) will always remember how you made them feel. (laughs) Oh, yeah. (laughs) Embarrassed. Yeah, it'd be horrifying. (laughs) Yeah. And so it's just really important just to be mindful and not just charge in. And, And it's also important, especially in this hybrid world where people are working all over the world, this may not be a great time. Like, it's dinner for me right now, right? And for you, it might be the start of your work day. You know, I'm done. I don't want to have this conversation at dinner time. So just being aware and setting up the conversation so that it's a successful conversation. I mean, that all sounds like empathy to me, right? It's trying to feel well, how will the other person feel and put yourself in their shoes. Yeah. And it's also about awareness, right? Because you might say, you know what? I never even thought of that. That doesn't mean you're not empathetic. It just means you never. it never occurred to you. You know, right now you and I are on Zoom. I don't know who is sitting next to you. (laughs) It could be your boss. I don't know. You know, so it's different when we're in a room and I can see it's just you and me. Yeah. So I'm glad you brought that up, the topic of having a difficult conversation in that regard. And one of the things I thought was really cool about your book, Can We Talk, is you wrote about that, how to have difficult conversations from the boss's point of view. 
it's tough, you know, underperformance or firing or telling them they're not getting the raise or whatever. But what you did that I don't think other people have explored that's very powerful is you also wrote about it from the perspective of someone who has to ask their boss for a raise or say no to your boss when they're trying to dump more work on you or talk to your peers who you're supposed to collaborate across everywhere. And you actually have to have a zillion difficult conversations. And most people think of them just as the context that you just gave. So when you're not a boss, how do you initiate difficult conversations? So using the example of, you know, asking for a raise, I advise people to really think about why would your boss honor your request and not just going in and saying, you know, groceries have gone up a lot this year and I really could use more money. Well, that's not going to get you a raise. But if you come in prepared and you come in with what you have done and why you feel you deserve a raise, you will get a lot further along in that conversation. You won't be shut down right away. And hopefully you'll come out with at least you'll know where you stand and hopefully you'll get that raise. And how about building the confidence to do that? Well, I look at it like this. I look at it like the planes that go out, right? Every day that the plane goes out empty, they're never getting that revenue. So every day that you don't have the confidence to ask, you don't get that raise, which means you don't get that money. And you owe it to yourself. You have to have the courage of your talent. You owe it to yourself to at least ask. So you have to have the confidence to do this and you have to be thoughtful enough or curious enough to see it from your boss's point of view. It's back to, it's almost like that empathy thing, but being able to see what's in it for them. Influencing is always about what's in it for the other person, right? If you're in a negotiation, you're thinking about, well, how am I going to get this? Why would they honor my request? What can I give them so I get that? Yeah. So studies right now are showing burnout is at record high. And I think it's hard for someone to say no to their boss. They're, they've never done that. They just, and they don't think they're allowed. They've been given permission for whatever reason, a million reasons. But there's just too much on my plate. So what's your advice? How should someone communicate that they're overloaded to their manager? Well, it's interesting because I just had this conversation with one of my coaching clients and I shared the following with her. I told her because she has been communicating that there's way too much work here. I cannot get everything done. And her boss has told me that this is very valid. So it's not like she's making this up. And I finally said to her, your next step is to go to him in a very soft voice and just say the following, I am screaming for help and you cannot hear me. And then be quiet. And that kind of will change the dynamics that are going on. Like, oh my God, like, what does this mean? Like, why is she quiet? <laughs> because she has been screaming and it isn't working. So she needs him to really get the message that this is not sustainable. Yeah. And if I'm a manager of people, how do I respond? What do I have to do? Well, first of all, you have to acknowledge, I hear you. And if they're correct, you have to say, you're absolutely right. And then you have to get up out of your chair and you have to go to your boss and say, we have a situation here. Here's how I'd like to resolve it. Yeah. Is there any gender component to this in the way you advise people when you're coaching? The only thing I told her <laughs> is act like a man. <laughs> I'm like, do you think a guy would be sitting there waiting, you know, to to be given accolades for what they're doing. I know you're comfortable self-promoting, but do you think that your male colleague is not bragging about what he's gotten accomplished so far? I mean, we've seen studies on this and talked about it on this podcast before that two people, a male and a female, see the same job opening with a set of skills. And the man says, oh God, I have all those skills. And the woman's like, I don't have any of those. <laughs> and they're both equally skilled. So is that an issue? Oh my gosh, I was doing a leadership class for a very well-known software company and it was actually on executive presence for women and it was I did not know this but the leader of the group, the boss was in the room and she was female and um somebody was pushing back on this whole thing of self-promotion and asking for a promotion and all that stuff. And finally she stood up and she said, "Let me tell you something." She said, I can't tell you how many times your male colleagues are in my office every week asking when they're getting promoted. And I have 
never had any of you come into my office and ask that question. And then they got really quiet and then they decided, okay, maybe what I was saying was valid. (laughs) Yeah. So what's your advice to the channel early career female in the workplace that maybe doesn't quite have that courage yet and wants to be a leader, wants to step up to a leadership position someday? I always say to my clients, look, if you have a son or a daughter, what advice would you give them? Because it's always easier to give people advice than to take it ourselves. And then I remind them, again, that every opportunity that goes by that they don't get is just going to set them back further. So I try to meet them where they are, but I let them know that, yeah, it takes courage, but you got to do it. So there's a consistent thread around all your work. And I I think it's like the difficult conversations up and the managing up. Our podcast is called Leading Up. And you have a new Udemy course on pay, transparency, and advocacy. And I'm wondering, connect that, like, is that asking for more money? What's the problem that you're solving in your new course? The problem is this. Most people, including most managers, do not have any clue as to how compensation is structured in their organization. They just know their boss says to them, okay, you can hire somebody between this and this as far as money goes. And they have no idea where those numbers came from. And so when I propose that course, you know, I firmly believe that knowledge is power. And so if you understand how compensation programs are designed and implemented, then you'll have a better sense And you will be able to determine, are you being paid fairly? And sometimes we think we're not being paid fairly, but when you dig a little bit further, you realize that, oh, gee, maybe I am being paid fairly because I had no idea that the person next to me actually worked her way through college. You know, she was going part-time. And so she's got like seven years of experience and I have one. So maybe that's why she's making more money than I am. But then again, there are circumstances where you'll find that you're not being paid fairly. And so how do you approach your boss? And in the course, I've included scripts, language that you can use so that you're not like backing your boss into a corner and you're giving them the opportunity to advocate for you. And lastly, as you're probably aware, there are a lot of new pay transparency laws that are on the books. And this course is really also meant for employers who want to educate their workforce as to how pay is decided and so that they can open up and have these conversations in a productive way. Yeah, it seems to me, the the common sense to me is, if, if I'm an employee and I work at a place and we talk about this stuff, I guess I would be happier and more engaged than if I was at a place and we didn't. So this feels like a big idea that hasn't gotten big traction in the world yet. What do you think? It is definitely growing in traction. There have been studies done that when people feel like they're being treated fairly, they're more engaged. And, you know, it's those things that we don't talk about that make us wonder, like, well, what's really going on? And when organizations are transparent and they open up their books, and even if those books don't look great and they're like, you know what, we're really trying to do better, then that will really help them in their efforts to attract and retain the best people. So the thread that I'm going to sort of infer from all of your books, that there is at the heart of this having a good relationship with your boss, but I suppose a relationship with anyone that you want to influence and others up and down. How important is building relationships and building a network? Oh, it's extremely important. In fact, a lot of the work when I'm consulting or when I'm coaching, I say to my clients, this transfers like anywhere. You could try this at home, try this with your spouse, try this with your kids. This works, right? Building relationships, building a productive network, it takes time and effort, but boy, oh boy, those rewards really do pay off. I have two uh, kids who just graduated from college uh, a year ago. And let me tell you, I am coaching them every day on building their network. Yeah. Building those relationships, empathy for the boss, helping them achieve their goals, having the confidence to have those difficult conversations. So Roberta, as we wrap up here, we have a question that we ask all of our guests. 
and this can be personally or professionally, but what are you curious about and learning now? I'm learning how to play pickleball better. (laughs) Nice. (laughs) I have gotten a lot better, but I can improve and I'm taking my own advice and I'm looking for a coach. (laughs) Perfect. I think with that, Roberta, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Oh, it's my pleasure. And I look forward to having your listeners connect with me on LinkedIn. You know, I'd be happy to continue the conversation. Thanks again to Roberta Matchison for joining us today on the podcast. Follow Leading Up, a podcast from Udemy Business, wherever you find your podcasts. We'll be back next Wednesday with another episode to help you level up your leadership skills. Follow the show so you never miss a new episode. And if you like the show, leave a rating or a review. We love the feedback and it really helps us to find new listeners. To learn more about Leading Up or how Udemy can help you develop leaders at scale and move business forward, visit business.udemy.com. The Leading Up podcast is produced by Udemy in partnership with Pod People. Special thanks to our production team, Alex McManus, Amy Machado, Brian Rivers, Michelle O'Brien, and Carter Wogan. Our original theme is by Soundboard.